folks, and people may have heard this before, that uh, allegedly, because I wasn't there and I didn't read it firsthand, but I've heard that the guy we call Mark Twain, I think his real name was Samuel Clemens, um, he was renowned for his good memory even late in life. And I heard that this question was asked to him at a talk or question and answer he gave when he was, I think, something like 88 years old. And the question was a simple one. How do you, did you manage or do you manage to have such a good memory at such a uh, advanced age in life? And Twain looked at him and he said, I never tell a lie. And I used to start every time a patient would come with the problem of memory loss or possibly Alzheimer's or their family would come. I would start with that story because I think there's also some really profound wisdom in that story. The way that I used to explain it to patients is imagine you're walking down the street and you meet somebody, maybe somebody you knew or a friend or maybe not. And he says, Tom, what color is your shirt? And, you know, I put it on in the morning. I don't really remember. So I look down and I say, it's black. And uh, so, and the reason I do that is because <laughs> that's what it is. It is black. Now, imagine if the same encounter happened and I decided to lie about it. So I said, it's green. Now, imagine then I meet that same fellow maybe later that afternoon and I have the same shirt on. And he comes up to me and says, by the way, Tom, what color shirt do you have on? So if I had answered black, I could always at that point look down again at my shirt and say, I have a black shirt. And I would pretty much be 100% certain that I was correct. If, on the other hand, somehow I knew that I didn't give the right answer, I didn't look at my shirt, or that I lied about it, I would at that point have to remember, A, that I lied, and B, what the lie that I told was. In other words, I would have had to, I have to remember at that point that I said it was a green shirt, not a pink shirt or a blue shirt or a white shirt or any other color shirt. And so I would say, I would have to think and maybe take a guess and hopefully get it right and say, well, I think it was a green shirt. Even right then, I could hardly remember what I had said. Uh, I may, however, get it wrong and say it was a blue shirt. The, but the problem, no matter whether I get in that case uh, the answer right or wrong, it's very easy to see that, as I think Shakespeare said, uh, we create a tangled web for ourselves. And the problem is if you lie, <clears throat> then you have a whole lot of things you have to remember which you wouldn't have to remember otherwise. I, obviously, if I said it's black, I don't have to remember anything. All I have to do if somebody else asks me is to say that it's black. And the only other thing, and I think I do he remember that Twain uh, actually spoke about this. I think I would say that when he said lying, he also meant something we call exaggeration or something that I don't know even has a word, but under exaggeration. Um, and I used to hear this all the time, and I used to call my patients on this all the time. So how, how do you feel? Well, I feel horrible. My foot hurts 24 hours a day. So really? So do you ever sleep? Yeah, of course. I sleep, you know, four or five hours a day. I can't sleep well because my foot hurts. So during those four to five hours, does your foot hurt while you're sleeping? Obviously, the answer is no, because you can't possibly feel pain while you're sleeping. Uh, so they say, well, of course, doesn't didn't hurt when I was sleeping. Yeah, but you just said that your pain, you had pain 24 hours a day. 
And now you're telling me there was at least four or five hours that you didn't feel pain. Well, right. So during those, so, and you say you feel pain everywhere on your body. Yes. How about your left big toenail? Well, no, that doesn't hurt. That doesn't even feel anything. So actually, it's not true that you feel pain everywhere on your body. No. Where do you feel pain? I feel pain in my elbow. When do you feel pain? Uh, when I stick my elbow in the microwave. Is that the only time? Uh, yeah, it's the, actually the only time. Now, that's a whole different scenario uh, and something that you can actually do something about <clears throat> than the I have pain 24 hours a day and it hurts everywhere in my body, which is impossible to remediate because it's simply inaccurate. Whereas the other one, you could start by not putting your elbow in a microwave and see what happens. Uh, the the process of under-exaggerating, which I don't know if that's a word, uh, but it's sort of like the old Monty Python skit. I don't remember which Monty Python, but the one where my, maybe Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where the knight is in a battle and the other guy cuts his arm off and he says, it's a, just a flesh wound, cuts his other arm off, just a flesh wound cuts his legs off so he's just a torso squirting out blood just a flesh wound don't worry about it. and you see that in and this is in particular men uh not exclusively but uh how are you and they basically just had a heart attack and they're depressed and impotent and they're on six drugs oh, i feel fine <laughs> obviously the person isn't fine doesn't feel fine but for some reason, they uh, decided to under-exaggerate, which is also a different kind of lie. Um, now, you can get into the reasons why people do this. Uh, I would submit that the primary reason we exaggerate, and I think it's pretty much safe to say everybody does it to a certain extent. I've made a very concerted effort to do it as little as possible, both sides. Uh, but I think the predominant reason, even though there's probably many reasons and each one is individual to the situation, is that throughout one's life, nobody listened to you if you just said, yeah, my foot, my elbow hurts when I put it in a microwave. So as a child, you would say something is wrong or something hurts and nobody would pay any attention to you. And you learn that if you maybe said it in a hysterical or exaggerated way, that people would actually take you seriously, listen to you, and maybe even do something about it. That process, however, backfires the longer you use it. Uh, the same with, uh, it's the other side of it is with the under-exaggerating. Again, usually nobody listens to you. So you learn that it's better off not to say anything, even if you actually do need help. Uh, and it's better off to deal with your, yourself, which is not always such a bad thing, but sometimes it's not really the appropriate response. So the question is, what does this have to do with Alzheimer's? Now, interestingly, um, when you look at the brain by autopsy of patients who had severe memory loss, Alzheimer's, uh, what you see are something called neurofibrillary tangles. In other words, the nerve pathways, the nerves themselves, are all tangled up into knotted webs, um, which essentially interferes with their ability to transmit impulses. And you can imagine, uh, like Shakespeare said, uh, that we weave a tangled web for ourselves with our continual lying and exaggeration and under-exaggeration. And by doing so, that process is mirrored actually in our physiology. And instead of, in a sense, grooving a healthy, normal pathway... So you can imagine like water flowing down a stream. It flows over the rocks. And if, if it's going in a healthy path, 
which may be one sort of spiral path down the rocks, it gradually builds, uh, it carves out a track in those rocks, which makes it easier and easier for the water to go down that same path. And so you end up with a healthy flow because as time goes on, there's more and more wearing away. There's more and more of the water uh, essentially building out its own pathway. And I think that's the same thing that happens when you commit to the process of only telling the truth and not exaggerating or under-exaggerating. You build out very clear and regular and specific and healthy neural pathways. In other words, the nerves begin to flow in regular, consistent, healthy pathways which is the opposite of the process that happens in neurofibrillary tangles. In that process, because every time you say something, it's different because it's too difficult to remember what you said. So you keep making up things more and more and you build every time it's a new pathway for the nerves and then it starts crossing over other nerves and next thing you know, you have a tangled mess in your brain. The nerves are going in chaotic directions with no consistency. And then when you try to retrieve or access one of those memories, all you can find is a tangled mess. And I think you can see this in the histories of famous people that we know who ended up with Alzheimer's and they had a whole history of either telling or sometimes like the case with Ronald Reagan, who he was an actor. And so he his life as a politician, no matter what you think about what he said, but it was basically he was acting. And that's why I've also uh, predicted that Bill Clinton may have uh, some run in with some memory loss as time goes on because he was a ardent practitioner of the art of exaggeration and untruthfulness. Now, this may seem like a totally impractical and uh, irrelevant almost way of looking at it, but I can tell you that there have, were a number of patients over the years, and like I said, Every patient who came themselves or family members brought them in uh, with memory loss slash Alzheimer's. The first thing I did was tell them this story uh, and say, I want you to commit as much as you are able. And I want the people in your family to help you with this, first of all, by doing the same so that they're only telling the truth, not exaggerating or under-exaggerating. And as far as you are able, do, do the same. Anytime you catch yourself saying, I hurt all the time or my life is over and I can't live like this anymore. I mean, what does that even mean? Stick to the reality, stick to here is my experience right now. Here's how I feel right now. Right now I feel sad. I feel scared. I feel lonely. I have pain in my elbow. The pain is really getting me debilitated. So I don't feel like I can even keep going like this. All that is your actual real experience. I mean, that is useful information and you're setting up a communication pathway with your with your own self and that is the most important thing in leading you to be able to solve your problems i feel lonely and i wonder if somebody would be willing to sit with me for a half an hour and talk about our lives that is a called a doable request the the statement i'm always alone nobody ever wants to talk to me people's reaction to that is, yeah, this is a pathetic guy. I don't really want to talk to him. Or they, out of sympathy, may do it, but they don't really into it because you're, you're not communicating in a way that leads to uh, connection and understanding. And I've had a number of patients over the years who did just that. 
no diet, no anything, no detox, nothing. And the improvement was dramatic. And I urge anybody who's dealing with this to make this a rock solid commitment now because you need to do it like right now, not tomorrow, not next week, not when COVID is done, not any of that stuff. Just as of today, tell the truth, say what you mean, be specific, don't exaggerate, don't under exaggerate, just say what it is and let the chips fall where it may. So that's the first thing I need I wanted to say about Alzheimer's. The next thing is